Hey, everybody, and welcome to Reimagining Main Street. I'm Laura Richards, back from several weeks off, and that was really nice. But now we're back here with you to do the podcast, we're joined with Patrick Lee, CEO of Spark Business Institute. Hey, Patrick. Hello, Laura, and welcome back. Thanks. So, Patrick, today we're asking the question, um, is either political agenda uh, helping Main Street? And if not, what should business owners do to create meaningful improvements? Um, and I think that's a, that's, that is a great question. It's the crux of everything that we're always talking about. Um, and, uh, I think it's a good topic for today. And it's funny because we knew what the topic was going to be, but I was at a networking event this morning and I had a conversation that sort of informed where we were going with this because I went in, did my usual networking thing. A gentleman who I've never met before, um, came up to me, introduced himself. Um, and he felt a need to introduce himself by saying, I am fairly conservative blah, 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 blah. And um, I was struck by that because folks do tend to very quickly um, get to that issue. Um, they either avoid it completely or they're very quick to point out who they were. And so he identified himself that way. I said, okay, we started having a conversation and we were talking about, um, you know, small business issues, economic issues, all that sort of stuff. And what was fascinating to me about it was that the stuff he was bringing up and what he was complaining about and what he was railing against I've heard folks who would identify themselves to me as liberal business owners say the exact same thing. So it was a very telling thing for me that, you know, um, we are very polarized in this country and we are very divided by our political affiliations. And there's a lot, I think, of um, uh, social issues that we differ on. And there's a lot around, say, environmental issues that we differ on and, and on and on. But economically, most of us don't actually differ. And I find it interesting that, you know, um, you know, divided we're conquered, right? And I don't think that the powers that be have any issue with us fighting over stuff and not focusing on the economic realities of who we are as entrepreneurs. I hear you loud and clear on that, Patrick. And just if, uh, for other people that might need to rehear that one more time, we may not be politically aligned, but that doesn't mean that our economic interests don't align. And for small business owners, particularly, that's true. That's what you meant, right, Patrick? Uh, exactly. Um, you know, uh, I, I would say this, actually. I would say that, that, that you know, there's a mindset out there um, that, that entrepreneurs have that is what we're about. And, and if we if we recognize that, a lot of these differences would go away. So let me just talk real quick about this, right? Um, so the Republicans um, typically look at government as the boogeyman, right? Government is there over-regulating, over-taxing, you know, um, doing all sorts of nefarious things in the dark that are bad for us, okay? And they're, they're, they're the boogeyman there. Democrats, it's those corporations, right? Big, bad, evil corporations doing what they do, concentrating wealth, Wall Street and all. Um, and um, we're so scared, of, you know, which one scares us more is where we politically affiliate. The problem is that those two things are quite similar. The, 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 the corporate cog, right, and the government bureaucrat are very much resemble each other. Those environments are very similar. The one who's the odd one out at the table is us entrepreneurs. We don't we don't behave the same way as either of those two entities who are very, very similar. We're the odd one out and we don't recognize it. We're always so scared of one or the other that we're allying with the other one. But in truth, they're allied against us. If 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 we were to to think about um, what it means to be an entrepreneur, I think we would recognize very quickly that neither of these options actually is at all favorable for us. Yes, I hear what you're saying. So you're also describing here what is a dispersed economic system that we have here. So explain to us what is meant by dispersed economic power and why that's important. Well, let, let's look at um, small businesses. Okay, because small businesses are very, very different, right? You have mom and pop shops, you have local farms, you have regional based businesses, you have small to medium, you know, they all have different needs, you know, so where's that commonality, right? And we talked about that, that commonality is in that mindset, 
right? None of these folks are capable of influencing on their own what happens with government, and they're not capable on their own of, um, uh, you know, competing with large, huge companies and conglomerates that have all that buying power and all that capital behind them, right? So um, that whole uh, that whole piece um, is dispersed, right? We, we, we're dispersed. So what's the opposite of that? The opposite of that is concentrated power, right? So we have seen um, a lot of small businesses facing tough challenges in recent years, you know, with increased concentration of large corporations, increased difficulty of competing in um, uh, monopoly, monopolistic markets. Uh, you know, the thing that comes to mind would be something like, um, the, the, you know, like CVS versus the hometown pharmacy, right? And I actually have a little story on this that, that I watched happen. Um, I, when I moved to Kent Island, Maryland, when I got here, um, there was one drugstore on the island and it was called Kent Drugs. It was locally owned, independent drugstore, right? And um, a few years later, a Rite Aid opened across the street. So Rite Aid opened across the street, Kent Drugs is still there, but now there's a Rite Aid. Well, Caddy Corner, a Walgreens opens. And then four blocks down on the left side of the road, a CVS opens. Okay, so now this little Kent Drugs is sitting there with three of these huge corporate presences. Okay, that was um, probably 15, 17 years ago. Well, the CVS, the right end, and the Walgreens are still there. Kent Drugs is not there anymore. You tried uh, your best, Patrick. What? You tried your best. I did. I actually <laughs> shopped in that pharmacy is, I was going to save it myself, but I couldn't do it. Um, and you know, and that, and that, that points to all those, those things, inherent issues we know about, you know, buying power, access to capital, um, you know, uh, price breaks, you know, uh, all that sort of stuff that we always talk about is why that happened. But it's an indication of the reality of um, that concentrated power, right? Big get bigger, the small don't have a lot of options. Yeah, all everything that you said, all of the factors that you kind of just led up to has been part of the reason why small business has been in decline really for 20 years up until the last year and a half. We've seen those numbers really boomerang and startups have are increasing dramatically. Um, but I think a lot of that has to do, obviously, with um, folks feeling like it's a good time to leave their jobs and maybe they're, you know, they receive some money. Um we all saw the stimulus coming out, the PPP and the IDL loans and such. Um, those helped support new entrepreneurs as well. And this is just another example of how federal monetary um, policy impacts small business and why it's important for us to get our voices heard. Well, let's think about that for a second. And um, what you just said is kind of interesting because, um, you know, all of a sudden, you know, small business entrepreneurship is in decline for 20 years, nothing sort of stopping that. COVID happens and you're like, okay, um, wow, look, all of a sudden there's all these startups. Well, why is there all these startups? Well, a couple of things happened. And I think it's really interesting to look at them both. The first thing is that all of a sudden there was funds available. Now, we all know those funds were not supposed to be used in a lot of instances for what they were used for. But the fact that all of a sudden there was an ability to access capital meant that people were like, okay, let's try some of this stuff we could never try because we could never you know, get what we needed to make this happen. All right, there's that. And then there's a whole bunch of folks who started going, okay, like we've been stuck at home in COVID for however long, why the heck, you know, were we running on those hamster wheels like we were? Why don't we go ahead and, and do some of this? So there's unintended consequences of both, you know, COVID. Obviously, there's unintended consequences with COVID, but of the PPP and EIDL, and now all of a sudden, all that money sort of being pushed into the area. So I, I think um, it's interesting that is it just lack of capital that has created that decline, right? So, you know, I think on a macro level, there's an inherent problem. Um, conservatives believe it's okay, even positive, for wealth to concentrate at the top and think it will eventually trickle down to benefit folks at the bottom. Liberals lean towards creating a safety net and propping up the bottom and believe that it can actually be useful long term. Inherently, neither of these is proven true. 
Yeah. So let's take a look at each of these. Um, for the for the first look here, we're gonna go to one of the best known liberal political pundits, Robert Reich, who is Chancellor's Professor of Public Policy at the University of California at Berkeley, author of 18 books, and was the Secretary of Labor in the Clinton administration, and named by Time Magazine as one of the 10 most effective cabinet secretaries of the 20th century. Yep. So um, um, definitely prolific, has a lot to say. And uh, according to him, um, the public is being sold a big lie that unions and big government created our problems. Problems being deregulation, vast concentration of wealth, right? This is not fraud, it's, it's other issues. So he calls us to look at the last three decades in which we've cut taxes on the wealthy while re real wages stood still. With wages at a standstill, struggling Americans don't have savings to invest in the stock market. Their dollars are in their mortgages. Okay. Thus, their outcomes are profoundly different than Americans with big salaries and money in the stock market. Right. And, you know, from World War II era through the early 1970s, high income earners, which were people that made over $450,000 a year, were taxed at 50% of their income. According to Reich, the economic bargain was explicit. Government encouraged industry and working Americans to share in the fruits, buying houses and cars with pensions to tide comfortable retirements. And that is a quote um, from Michael Powell's article in the New York Times. All right. And Reich also points out that the political center isn't static. It's become much more conservative over time. And Reich says, what happened in the last 30 years is that the private sector worker has taken a shellacking and it has resulted in fewer and fewer locally owned businesses. Okay. I think it's interesting to note that he didn't say the private sector um, entrepreneur or business owner. He said private sector worker. Okay. Um, now, critics of this liberal approach like Princeton University's researcher Angus Deaton, um, who was awarded the Nobel Prize in economics, which I believe is probably one of the highest honors for those in that field. Um, they point to the lack of progress made through government handouts. Much of Deaton's career has been spent in learning the facts about people in poverty. Um, he set some of his findings out in a 2013 book titled The Great Escape. Um, Deaton pointed out that in many countries, where enormous amounts are spent to aid the poor, poverty rates have remained unchanged or grown worse. Yet in places such as China and India, where relatively little is spent there, prosperity is shared by larger segments of the population. Yeah, so I think it's interesting. These are both very, um, you know, scholarly people that have all kinds of answers, right? Um, but basically what they're saying, um, is that the other side's programs haven't worked. The things that have been tried by both conservatives and liberals don't work. So that doesn't mean we need to do more of these things that don't work. So if we're not doing more of what doesn't work, Patrick, what are we doing? <laughs> so what is that alternative? And um, I, I think that's a great, I think it's a great point it needs to be emphasized again. Um, I think that both sides have done an excellent job showing that the other side doesn't know what they're talking about, okay? But nobody has proven to know what they're talking about, right? They're wrong, they're wrong. Okay, let's argue about who's more wrong, but what do we do? Um, I don't think we're likely to change the political system um, quickly anyway. Um, it, it seems like it's gonna get worse before it gets better right now. Um, but in, in, in truth, um, the answer is one we've said many times. I just think we need to get a little bit more specific about what we're saying, because we, we've said all along, you know, we're talking about dispersed economic power versus concentrated. The only way we're going to compete with concentrated economic power on Main Street is if we find a way to concentrate our dispersed power, right? Mm -hmm. um, so we've got to band together for the common good and advocate, advocate for what we need. Um, you know, big corporate businesses are far different than mom and pops. And that's in far different from employee-based regional business. They all have different needs. Um, and, you know, we are constantly trying to figure out where we belong with the powers that be. But we don't belong anywhere with the powers that be. Um, we, we've, we have to create our own power that be. And so here's an answer for you all. 
We need to be politically agnostic, okay? Whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, if you're a business owner, stop choosing between the lesser of two evils and start letting your voice be heard, okay? If, if you're more scared of the government, so you're going to vote Republican, then you're going to get a bunch of those policies, Republican-based policies, concentration of wealth and all that doesn't help Main Street. And if you go the other way and you're going to go with a liberal piece and you're going to look at it that way, you're, you're going to end up with overregulation, overtaxation. Um, you're going they, they, they both have shown what they can not do. <laughs> um, so let's let our voice be heard. Let's, let's become agnostic. Let's band together and let's vote in blocks around our pocketbooks. Not all those social issues that divide us and all those other political affiliations that divide us. We stop rooting for which of the political teams we prefer and start looking around and saying, okay, the same way that when I met the guy um, at the networking event this morning, I'm telling you, had I taken him and one of my liberal business owner clients and not let them identify what they were initially and just start talking about those economic issues facing Main Street, they would be in unison. Very well said. Thanks everybody for tuning in today. I hope this was helpful to you. I know it was helpful to me in the making of this podcast and we look forward to seeing you back here next week. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.